Thank you. Welcome everyone. My name is Julie Lindo. Welcome to San Francisco Bay Physicians for Social Responsibilities event, Extreme Heat, the Deadliest Climate-Related Health Hazard. How can we advocate for health and equity protections? Before we start, I'd like to remind you we are recording. Also, we want to acknowledge that San Francisco PSR is located on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco area. And I'd like to tell you just a little bit about San Francisco Bay Physicians for Social Responsibility. SF Bay PSR mobilizes health professionals and advocates to promote public policies that support solutions and intertwined and the intertwined public and environmental health emergencies posed by nuclear weapons and militarism, our accelerating climate crisis, and the deep injustices rooted in structural inequity and racism. To learn more about events, resources, and how you can take action or donate, please visit our website at sfbaypsr.org sign up for our newsletter, events, and action alerts. We only send one email a week. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and now LinkedIn. Please post a little bit about yourself in the chat. And when we have the discussion, please turn your video on just to, because it makes the discussion a little better and easier for all of us to converse and connect. Now, a little introduction for our event this evening. Extreme heat is the deadliest climate-related health hazard. Climate change is increasing the frequency, duration, and severity of extreme heat events. And protective measures, especially for the most vulnerable patients, workers, lower income, and frontline communities are not keeping pace. Fortunately, protections from heat are more achievable than protections from extreme, other extreme weather events. Tonight, we welcome a panel of experts to discuss these issues, what we need to do to advocate for equitable access to health info and care, to ensure an equitable and just transi transition to heat cooling pumps and protected electricity access, and what we can do on the state, local, and state levels to advocate for policies and regulations that ensure equal access to cooling and health protections and a just transition to renewable energy and electrification. For those of you who are not familiar with the electrification movement, and for those of you who've been working so hard on it, you haven't had time to look up, I want to take a moment to reflect on where we are at in this historical movement toward electrification. The Inflation Reduction Act and other sources of, of funding are making large amounts of money available for electrification. For example, the California Energy Commission has $900 million to spend on their equitable building decarbonization program, and they are hosting workshops this summer to gain feedback from environmental justice communities and stakeholders. Also, in just four years since Berkeley passed the first building electrification reach codes, more than 100 cities across the country have done so. In the Bay Area on March 15th, the Air District passed the first in the nation standards for zero emission furnaces and water heaters, thus furthering the transition to healthier electric appliances. In the Bay Area, the majority of our electricity is now from renewable sources. We are facing a great challenge to construct more renewable power sources and to transition everything we can to be all electric. People have questions and concerns, and that's understandable. It is a great challenge, but it is also a great opportunity to not just save our climate and improve our health, but to also build in more equity and justice into our systems, into energy, transport, housing, health, and communities in general. It is a way to offer some reparations to those communities who suffered the most health harms attributable to redlining and racism, communities who live near toxic sites, 
and who suffer from compounded outdoor and indoor air pollution and often more extreme heat. Under, but understandably, people have a lot of questions, as I said, but every day I see on the various building electrification lists that I'm on, hundreds of passionate scientists, innovators, community members, healthcare professionals, activists, policymakers, in intense conversations, trying to figure out every detail of this puzzle. We are all part of a huge historical movement and together I know we can do it. So with all that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Rupa Basu. She is currently the chief of the air and climate epidemiology section at the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment and the California Environmental Protection Agency. She serves on several statewide and national climate change committees. She has she was featured in the Emmy award-winning climate change documentary, Years of Living Dangerously, Mercury Rising episode with Matt Damon. Dr. Basu's work is widely cited and has received a lot of media attention, including the New York Times, the New Yorker, LA Times, SF Chronicle, National Public Radio, and BBC World News. We are absolutely honored to have her here tonight. I hand the mic to you, Dr. Basu. Thank you so much for that warm welcome and the introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here to present a few of our slides from work that we've completed in the last few years. Um, I'm going to focus on adverse birth outcomes, but um, next slide, please. I'm actually gonna start with a uh, background on why heat-related deaths are so underreported. First, there's no systematic definition for heat wave. It varies by local health department or region for that reason. And the vulnerable subgroups are also different. So when we're thinking about heat advisories, each community is going to have different thresholds for um, heat in terms of daytime or nighttime thresholds. That's my next bullet. Oh, next one, yep. And um, sometimes the uh, definitions could range from something like 98th percentile of temperature distribution in a specific area for two or more days. But of course that varies so much that it is difficult to really, uh, report any heat-related deaths or illnesses. And actually, they're only reported when there's a heat wave, and that's a surveillance bias in epidemiology, or when no other cause of death or illness is suspected. So it's important to really consider all uh, health risks, um, not just the classic heat-related deaths and illnesses, so, um, so far in our group uh, at OEHA, we have looked at temperature or heat wave and increases uh, uh, in emergency room visits, hospital admissions, and mortality. Now, the first thing I want to say is we've noticed that it doesn't take a heat wave to see these associations. We've seen this already with just apparent temperature, which is a combination of temperature and humidity during um, warm summers in California that, were, that we've already experienced. So all of these health outcomes we're already seeing. Of course, they are projected to get worse with um, more heat waves in the future. But just to give an example of some of the other types of uh, health risks that we've seen, there's cardiovascular, including heart attacks, respiratory, including asthma, diabetes, mental health, including uh, suicides, homicides, and other mental health conditions, liver and kidney disease, infectious diseases, gastrointestinal diseases, as well as adverse birth outcomes. And of course, I've highlighted that because I'm going to focus my uh, next few slides on that, specifically on preterm delivery. So just to uh, go over some of the high-risk populations, um, there's the elderly, and when we first started this research uh, a couple of decades ago, we really thought this was um, a exposure that will only affect or primarily affect the elderly population. We know that that isn't true. 
Other high-risk populations are uh, socially isolated populations, pregnant people, young children and infants, outdoor workers such as farm workers, taking certain medications such as beta blockers for heart disease or antidepressants, which we know are also related to heat, um, living on higher floors of apartment buildings, um, often without air conditioners and other building characteristics, um, poverty, which is measured in so many different ways, and young athletes. Now, I wanted to bring up all of these groups. There are more, but just to kind of highlight that it varies and it really varies by location. So when there's a heat advisory and a certain group is not included, they don't even know to take precautions. So um, that's part of the reason why we study um, populations and try to really identify the high risk populations. Next slide, please. So this is one of the first large scale studies to look at temperature and risk of preterm delivery. We chose California as our study population being a state agency. And this was published back in 2010. So you can see that really the literature has not been around for that long when we're thinking about heat or temperature and adverse birth outcomes. Next slide, please. So we don't have to focus so much on the actual numbers, but more on the patterns here. I just, uh, on the y-axis, we have the percent change per 10 degree Fahrenheit in apparent temperature. So um, what you could see is the overall result is about 9% increase. So that means that all pregnant people, regardless of race or ethnicity, are at high risk. There's a very strong association and actually stronger than what we had um, seen or observed in the elderly. So uh, just to give an example for quantification, there was about a 2.3% increase for cardiovascular diseases among the elderly population. And you can see that this 9% risk in pregnant people is quite, um, we were actually quite, um, we were not expecting the risk to be this high. But what I wanna point out here is that by race or ethnic group, there is a disparity. So if you look from left to right, um, and this is how it's coded in our database from the California Birth Certificate data, um, there's black or non-Hispanic black, uh, Hispanic, white, and Asian. Asian, we actually created on our own. It is still a very heterogeneous population, but we just decided to include it because that is something that we can, uh, a, a race uh, category that we can consider in California. So uh, the white population has about a 6.6% increase. So that's less than the overall risk, but you can see that the black population has a 15% increased risk. Hispanics are also at about an 8% risk and Asians have at about a 10% risk. So there is a disparity with the highest risk for black people. Next, please. And then if you look at uh, maternal age, uh, very similar uh, pattern, and this is what we call a dose response. So the younger the maternal age, the higher the risk. So under 20, has a 14% chance of uh, increased risk. And then 35 and older has about a 3.6% increase. So I just wanted to show that there's also uh, variations by age. Next slide. So with the California birth certificate data, we really couldn't look at a lot of factors. So I uh, put together a grant with the Kaiser Permanente Division of Research where we could uh, factor in their health data. So they have variables such as um, maternal factors, comorbidities, um, uh, behavioral patterns, and things like that. Next slide. So uh, right off the bat, you could see that smoking status, alcohol use, pre-existing diabetes, and pre-existing hypertension all had increased risk. So the, for the populations that had um, any of these um, risk factors, they had uh, quite a significant increased risk compared to those who didn't have these risk factors. I have a little bit of an animation here. So I think the rest of it, yeah, there you go. So behavioral factors, you could see smoking has about 32% increased risk. Alcohol, similar, 36% uh, 
Medical conditions, so pre-existing diabetes, 45%, and pre-existing hypertension had about an 85% increase, which is quite alarming. Um, I also wanted to say that there's an increase for um, gestational diabetes and hypertension, but the relationship was not as strong and also not shown here is there was an um, association with preeclampsia as well. So just to kind of um, summarize the high-risk groups um, from um, high temperatures and preterm delivery were Black, Hispanic, and Asian populations, younger age, having hypertension or diabetes, alcohol use, or smoking. These are some of the risk factors. And of course, it really varies by the uh, study population. So if we're looking at another adverse birth outcome um, or uh, another exposure, the uh, populations at risk could be different. Next. So I, I wanted to go over the mechanism. So it starts with acute dehydration. Some of the symptoms are vomiting, diarrhea, nausea, which we know are very common during pregnancy, um, and especially during the windows of, of exposure that we're interested in. So sometimes it might be missed that the connection to the heat exposure or the, to the ambient heat exposure may not be made because it might just be, oh, this person is pregnant and that is why that's the explanation given for these symptoms, but it's really important to identify dehydration in pregnant people. And uh, next, uh, that um, dehydration could lead to oxidative stress and inflammation which releases oxytocin in the body. And that is what triggers the body to uh, decrease uterine blood flow. And when all of this happens, this could result in decreased fetal growth and induces uh, labor sometimes prematurely. And finally, so this first study that I showed you was published back in 2010. A couple of years ago, I was part of a collaboration where um, there was a systematic review on all studies in the US. So just in that 10 year period really, um, or here that we've got a 12 year period, um, has so much um, consistent uh, associations between not just heat, but also air pollution, PM two and a half and ozone and preterm birth, low birth weight and stillbirth. It's really important to have this consistent evidence because now we're showing that it's not just one area or one study or one study population, but it's actually something that we're seeing across the board. And that disparity that I showed you by race ethnicity was also um, reported repeatedly. And so that is another finding that we found, whether it was um, Hispanics and asthma or um, heat and uh, more um, focused on the uh, black population. Next. So some of the reasons for disparities, and I think it's important only because if we don't discuss these, then we can't make things better, just like we if we don't identify the high-risk populations. So the exposure itself is greater. Um, we already talked about this a little bit, but greater exposures to heat and air pollution. And this is a result of historical redlining places where people live. Um, there could be closer to power plants, fossil fuel combustion areas, uh, freeways, urban heat island, where that just means there's more urban heat um, or heat in urban areas are is retained. There's less green space. And so it actually appears to be hotter in those areas than in the semi-rural uh, or semi-urban areas that are surrounding. Um, this is often referred to as environmental racism or environmental justice. And then on the other end, we also have a disparity by health outcomes. Even if we don't have these exposures, we see that there is a greater risk for Black people to um, deliver prematurely, to have lower birth weight, to have greater infant mortality, which I didn't cover here, um, stillbirth, all of these outcomes. So um, part of these, uh, the explanation is that um, lower socioeconomic status, um, there's a high cost to use air conditioning, which is often used to cool down. Um, if there's uh, an episode of a wildfire or even a heat wave, relocation may not be feasible. 
um, for some people who may have to work during that time. That also includes healthcare workers. Um, there's less access to healthcare. Um, some populations uh, feel like because of the cost that um, the ER is or the emergency room is used for primary care. But really, even with the same access to healthcare, there might be some differential treatment by skin color. And that's an area that I think needs um, to be focused on quite a bit to find more um, healthcare practitioners, um, clinicians, caretakers, doulas, everything to um, really have a little bit more representation. So not just more women, but also women of color. Next slide. So I just wanted to show in the last uh, couple slides, different ways in where uh, which our research has been used in uh, the state. Um, so uh, this is the fourth uh, climate change assessment that was uh, published back in 2018. Um, many state agencies are now working on a new report that would be published in the next couple of years but this is the latest that we have. You could see that there are many um, factors of uh, climate change, um, temperature in, in California specifically. So temperature is increasing, sea levels are um, uh, rising quite rapidly. In some areas, snowpack is declining except for this year. Um, and then we have seen some heavy precipitation events also that are related. But then in other years, we have had extreme and exceptional drought and wildfires in the last few years like we haven't seen um, before. So these are all issues that we face in California. I just touched upon a very small part of the temperature studies um, just to give you an idea, but I do want to point out that there's all these other climate change related issues that I did not cover. So some recent bills um, that have been passed in California direct as it, it's almost as a directly a result from the epidemiologic studies or some of the studies that I show. Uh, we had the SB 65 Momnibus led by Nancy Skinner a couple of years ago to specifically focus on improving maternal and fetal health outcomes for communities of color. There is also a federal Momnibus that is trying to be passed um, with very similar intentions. Um, but California, um, we passed this a couple years ago. Um, a couple that we're now working on is AB 2238, which focuses on extreme heat um, and where a statewide extreme heat ranking system will be developed as well as naming um, heat waves. And then AB, 2, AB 2240, which focuses on perinatal and infant children's health also related to extreme heat. Thank you so much for your attention. If you have any questions, please feel free and you don't get a chance today, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Oh, sorry about that, everyone. It looks like um, Julie is rejoining us. Um, she got kicked out. Does anyone have any um, follow-up questions about that presentation? Hi, um, my name is uh, Dan Stratton with an organization called uh, Slipstream. I'm I'm curious. I, given the complexity of the of the issue and of the risk factors, oh, I apologize. I was supposed to put it in my video. Um, the uh, complexity of the risk factors, etc. What you might recommend as um, if if we were going to try to sort of prioritize or focus on certain geographic areas. Uh, to to support, I mean, certainly want to support everywhere, but uh, really focus on certain geographies. What would you say would be like uh, data indicators that we could use to kind of help guide us in that? Thank you. Yeah, um, so of course that varies quite a bit. So if we're thinking nationwide versus within California, and then 
even within California, if we think of a county like LA, so heterogeneous. So it really varies, but the high risk populations, there's a lot of mapping tools like UCLA, for example, has a heat mapping tool that shows higher risk populations. Um, and at OWEHA, we have Cal Virescreen that also shows those areas that are higher risk. And it seems like it pretty much doesn't matter if we're talking about heat, air pollution, or even COVID, the high risk groups are pretty similar across the board. So depending on which area you wanna target, there are tools to help figure out what which areas those are. So for California, for example, some people might point to areas that might not be as high risk for other things like coastal areas for heat because there is less um, adaptation to heat. There, we don't experience um, heat waves as much. So when it does hit a population in this area, it will um, have a larger or has the potential to have a larger effect. Northern California, we don't have air conditioners. So that's uh, you know more of a community level thing, but it really um, varies. I would say the largest risk is probably um, the Central Valley, um, even though they're maybe more accustomed to uh, higher temperatures. Some of the temperatures that we're seeing now going to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, it doesn't matter who you are, that we're, we just can't adapt as humans. And um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, but it just really does vary. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions? All right. Thank you again so much. That was a wonderful presentation. And uh, Julie, would you like to take the next introduction or I can um, do that for Dr. Cooper as well? Oh, looks like Julie's having computer problems. There she yeah. is. Are you, there? Are you back? Um, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> okay, I will. Go um, for it. Yeah, I'll we'll go, go for, for questions it. for Dr. Bosco. Go for it, Giselle. Okay. Next, we have our next speaker is Dr. Robin Cooper. Um, she is a San Francisco psychiatrist in private practice for the last 40 years and is on the voluntary uh, faculty as associate clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of California, San Francisco. She is co-founder and current president of Climate Psychiatry Alliance and member of the San Francisco Bay PSR Environmental Health Committee. Her concern for environmental justice has fueled her interest in understanding the differential impacts of climate disruption on poor, underserved communities, including on mentally ill individuals. And now I will hand it over to Dr. Robin Cooper. Unmute myself, here I am. Thank you very much, Giselle, and for the wonderful presentation that we've all just heard. Um, I have just a few introductory comments before I get into some of the content. First off, I'm going to be talking about how heat affects our mental health, our thinking, our behavior, our feelings. And I will suggest to all of us, Dr. Basu told us about the health impacts and, and listed some of those, but we all live in the space of what we think and feel. So I think this relates to all of us. I also just want to thank Dr. Basu for clearly indicating the um, disparities and the underlying social determinants of health. That goes through all of these, in, uh, of what I'm going to be talking about also. So next slide. Now, for extreme heat, those periods that we've already determined are elevated temperatures that are sustaining above the norm in a community. So they happen everywhere. They don't just happen in the Central Valley, although if your baseline is very high, that differential can be quite uh, challenging, but they happen right here, 
in our temperate climate. And we all have experienced these. We have all had some impact from extreme heat. And I'd call that a climate disaster. And we know this. We know that this affects our feelings and thoughts and behavior because our language tells us that. He's so hot-headed. He's so hot-tempered or so angry. My blood boils. Or that guy's so hot under the collar. Or the admonition, keep cool, man, chill out. Next slide. But scientific evidence and the studies that are in the literature indicate that extreme heat isn't just those kinds of things that we all feel uncomfortable about, but have profound impacts on our behavior, our mood, our thinking, and our ability to concentrate, and our sleep. And I'm going to go into some of these uh, and drill down a little bit more. So next slide. Aggression. Now, we know aggression and violence is a very complex behavior and not solely determined by one thing. But the accumulated evidence in the literature indicates that there are specific drivers just of extreme heat that underscore violence and aggression. We know that violence increases during late spring and summer when, when changes in temperature increase. We also know that, um, that violence is, um, is worldwide. This is not something that is in any specific locale, but it's a worldwide ph phenomena. And I'm particularly concerned about the impacts on those who are vulnerable, children and women, who may be at increased and are at increased risk for domestic violence during these periods. Now, this aggression is seen across the spectrum, from kids on the baseball field all the way up to intergroup violence and gangs and warfare. Um, and heat alone can be a driver of this. Next slide. So as I've said, heat increases. It's a linear kind of relationship. One standard deviation increase above the norm in any particular community uh, increases violence between individuals at 4% and a 14% increase in groups. And the, and the graphic on the slide shows you that those violent crimes increase during those hotter periods of the, of the year when there are spikes in temperature and increase in violent crimes. Next slide. Now, suicide. I think about suicide as aggression turned toward the self, a kind of behavior of aggressiveness toward our own being. And we know, again, suicide is a very complex behavior, but the accumulated literature indicates that there are heat drivers for increases in suicide alone. And this is, this is a, accumulated in uh, literature that is so, shown repeatedly that is of great concern. But a particular study done out of Stanford um, came up with this data. Marshall Burke showed a comparison, uh, looked at two com at communities in Mexico and in the United States and found that for um, one degree centigrade over the monthly average temperature, there is a 0 0.7 increase in suicides in the United States and 2.1 increase in Mexico. I think what's so profound about this study is the projected predictions that he and his group offered. He, it, he estimates that there would be 21,000 more suicides by 2050 due to heat alone if we don't do something to change the trajectory of, of heat. And then what that does is it, it eliminates, that's equivalent to eliminating all of the impacts of suicide prevention programs, gun control measures, although we're pretty slim on gun control these days, and also the copycat events when celebrities suicide. 
wipes these out completely. Next slide. And then other impacts. We all experience trouble sleeping when it's hot, particularly if we don't have air conditioning. And the impacts on sleep are profound. Now, in order to fall asleep and sustain sleep, our bodies have to drop our temperatures by a small amount. And that's not possible when nighttime temperatures are sustained. And then heat, that sleep has ramifications for many aspects of functioning and are likely drivers of some of the difficulties in cognition and mood. And we know that during extreme heat, there are, there are significant changes in, in cognition, our ability to concentrate, to learn, and learning is particularly important. Children who go to school where there are no protections in their classrooms do not learn well when it is extremely hot out. And we also know that performance academically drops during periods of extreme heat. A study looking at, um, at students in the dorms in, at Harvard, one air conditioned and one not, differentially performed on exams the next day. Um, and then the ability to concentrate and their impact, impacts then on work performance and work injuries. And then mood. We know that mood is impacted by extreme heat. That crankiness that we all feel earlier can be quite a bit more substantial for those with troubles with mood and depression can be a part of that. Next slide. So I'm gonna transition to a toolkit that I developed to, to use as a, as a tool that clinicians can use with patients because I think that it's really, uh, unless clinicians have something to do and offer assistance, they're going to not talk about this. And I think many, many people do not understand the severity of the impacts of extreme heat. So this was designed to be used with patients and with the public. And it outlines some of the things to do to maintain and keep yourself cool and safe during extreme heats, heat events. They're not rocket science. They're not like, you know, unusual kinds of things that we have to do, but they're things people don't know. And so how to keep your room cool uh, with shades, using cool water showers, not cold, wearing loose clothing, the rest you can kind of see, getting to a cooler place, cooling stations where people can go. And the backside shows some of those um, warning signs and also some of those who are most at risk, um, and particularly in the field that I'm in, in psychiatry. Next slide. This tool has been translated into Chinese, a significant population in our community, and into Spanish. And I think that's a very important need since we know that people without English proficiency often don't have adequate access to preventive healthcare information. And we need to address that across the spectrum. So these tools were developed again to use in the general population, but also for clinicians to have something that they can have in their back pocket so that they're prepared to assist patients. Next slide. And there's more that we can get into in our discussion. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to share this. Thank you so much, Robin. Can everybody hear me? Giselle, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Thank you, Robin. I posted your toolkits in the chat. Um, they're absolutely fantastic. Um, our next speaker is Jessica Guadalupe Tovar. She is a longtime climate and environmental justice organizer in a variety of urban, rural, and indigenous communities throughout California. 
Jessica started with the Environmental Justice and Climate Change Initiative in 2003, working with organizations across the US on issues of climate justice. Since then, she has battled various polluting corporations, PG&E in Hunters Point, Richmond Chevron Oil Refinery, and many others. She is currently an energy democracy organizer with the Local Clean Energy Alliance, fighting for equity in clean energy solutions to bring clean power to the people. Jessica, I hand the mic to you. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Bear with me for just a second. While and I Jessica, if you, can, if you can turn your volume up a little bit, that would be helpful. Uh -oh. <laughs> Better? A little bit. If you better? can turn it up a little higher, that would be great. But we, we can hear you. Oh, that is as high as it will go. <laughs> okay. That's great. I'm really loud. I'm a naturally loud person, so I'm going to do that. Okay, let me share my screen. All right. Okay. All right. I have a few slides here. Loading. A little slow. Okay, cool. All right. So I'm Jessica Tovar with the Local Clean Energy Alliance. Uh, very fond of Physicians for Social Responsibility. We've been working uh, alongside each other for some years now. Um, first, I want to start off by saying that before we electrify, we really have to do energy efficiency, and there's lots of other things that we need to do um, in addition, and the reason why I say energy efficiency is in order to use, you know, um, you know heat pumps, which I'm going to talk about, um, you want to make sure that your home is sealed well so that you're not wasting energy, right, so you don't have to keep you know, uh, your appliance is running. So you want to make sure the windows are sealed, um, there's insulation, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of a lot of pre-work that needs to be done, especially for our older uh, housing stock. Um, and in addition to that, sometimes that requires a lot more rewiring of our homes to be able to start using uh, more electrified appliances within our homes. Right. And so, again, just recognizing that a lot of our homes are actually really old and they were not designed for um, exclusive electrification. So to begin uh, moving from using methane gas in the home and actually replacing all our appliances with electrified appliances, there's a lot of pre-work that needs to be done. OK, so let's talk about heat pump water heaters. Um, so one thing I want to say about heat pump water heaters is that they're actually a lot more efficient. Um, you don't have to uh, you don't have to use gas, but you also don't have to use as much um, energy to run them. And they're really cool because they they do uh, they do two things. You know, they move heat into where it's needed, um, or they move you know cooler air into where it's needed. Um, and then the they will move the stuff. It's kind of like when you put a fan in your window and it's pulling in the cooler air and pulling out the hot air from your room. It's like that, but better, right? Um, so that is um, a new technology that's gaining a lot more traction and it is where we're going when it comes to actually electrifying and replacing those polluting um, gas methane appliances in our home. Um, so some of us might still have gas furnaces um, within our home. Um, and just to show what the pump looks like, this is what you can use to replace that gas furnace um, that might be in your home. Or this could also be, um, I like to think about what we could be doing like in our schools, for example, or our workplaces as well. And this really would create more comfort, right? The heating and cooling that we need within our homes. Um, and one of the things that our organization is really doing is really advocating also for being able to power these systems at a local level. So really building a lot of more solar and battery storage um, within our communities, if not on our homes and our businesses, um, at least 
some kind of shared solar model um, to begin to power a lot of these um, appliances and specifically the heat pumps. Um, and there are other appliances as well, like our stove, um, induction cooktops, uh, things like that. Um, so just to highlight again, the heat pumps um, and a lot of these newer like uh, electrified appliances are really more efficient um, and they're less polluting, obviously, than methane gas. Um, I will add that right now, uh, heat pumps, the cost ranges from somewhere between $3,000 to $8,000 um, and highlight that very recently, um, this last March in the Bay Area for folks who are in the Bay Area, um, there's a huge campaign to get our local air district um, to actually ban gas appliances, start phasing them out. Um, and so we pretty much want a rule where um, zero emission water heaters will now be, be sold um, starting in 2027. So if your gas furnace or the gas appliance breaks, um, you're, you will only be able to buy um, the electrified uh, version. And for furnaces, that would be in 2029. Um, and for large commercial um, appliances, the year would be 2031. Okay. So, and all the reasons why we're really emphasizing um, this switch, I mean, there's so many reasons, but first just to acknowledge the indoor air pollution is very high in a lot of our homes. And partly it's because of the appliances that we use in our homes that are gas-based, but also because of the pollution outside of our homes that tends to settle um, in our homes. So when you think about cumulative impacts, that's a lot of pollution that we're exposed to. Um, let's see. And then we all know, again, that that leads to, you know, respiratory diseases, aggravation of asthma, or if you live in a heavily polluted community, um, developing onset um, asthma is an issue as well. Okay, and so the reason why we do this work is really because we wanna advance more clean energy solutions and specifically in communities that have been historically heavy bur burdened uh, by environmental injustice, right? Um, and so some of the challenges that we're currently dealing with is um, really addressing the need for producing more clean electricity um, doing complete decarbonization or electrification retrofits um, in communities that, that need it the most, specifically those communities that are heavily burdened by pollution. Um, and we've been addressing a lot of issues about um, concerns about potential uh, gentrification, for example, the fact that we're dealing with wildfire smoke and planned power shutoff specifically from PG&E. Um, and then there's, all, there's also both challenges and opportunities, and I'll speak a little bit, um, a little bit about those. Um, and just addressing that right now, we're really dealing with how do we bring people's bills down, right? And if we're using more efficient appliances, um, then the cost would be less than using gas. We all know that gas has been very, very expensive. Um, let's see. Okay, so I will mention also uh, a lot of work we do is around community choice energy policy. And I just wanna highlight, depending on where you're based, you might, if you're interested in electrification and, and access to these appliances and more incentives, you can contact your local com community choice program to see if they have any programs. Um, in the Bay Area, a good place to start would be, if you're in the East Bay, Stop Waste or Bay Ren really help folks with how to access. And one of the things that we're really um, considering is that, and, and recognizing is that people do need kind of a one-stop shop. It's kind of uh, uh, hard to do all the research yourself and find all the different incentives. And so there are um, some, there is some assistance from programs through like Stop Waste and Bay Rent. Uh, let's see. So um, particularly in the East Bay, there is a current pilot right now to do energy efficiency and building elect, uh, electrification for low to moderate income homeowners. 
Um, and the retrofit itself cost $37,000, but I believe um, 10,000 of that would be um, incentivized by the local community choice program. So there is a huge discount there for those who can afford it. Um, we are looking to, um, let's see, I'm gonna skip a little bit here. We are looking to use um, different models to finance these things too. So there is something called on-bill financing, which I'll mention in the next slide, um, but that is used within the East Bay Community Energy Pilot, where the savings from your bill will apply to uh, paying part of the retrofit over time. Um, and so, like I mentioned, that retrofit is about $37,000. It will cost $26,480 um, in, in 15 years of being paid off. Um, so there is some incentive through that program and other programs might be offering different things. So if you have a community choice program, I would reach out to them if you're interested. Um, I mentioned on bill repayment. Again, that's pretty much just using the savings from your new retrofit from your bills to be applied towards payment to that upgrade that you just done in your home. Um, and just to highlight that in that pilot that East Bay Community Energy is doing, um, people's bills will be a little bit higher because the savings itself isn't enough to pay off the retrofit, but your bills will be a little bit higher, probably about $60 a month for the next um, 12 to 15 years until you pay off the entire uh, upgrade to the home. Um, so one of the things that we're really emphasizing right now is really how to reach communities that need access to, you know, cleaner indoor home air and clean appliances and the switch um, to clean energy and clean energy uh, based appliances. So we're really trying to do the work, um, the policy work and access federal and state funding to begin to do these in the communities that have been left out of the clean energy economy. Uh, kind of laying out all the different communities, historically harmed, Black, Indigenous, people of color, low income, elderly, the disabled, the detained, formerly incarcerated, our youth, immigrants, veterans, renters, unhoused, women, LGBTQIA communities, and all the other um, folks in our communities that we work very hard to uplift. So I will stop there. I hope that this was very helpful. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Can everyone, Giselle, Marge, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Thank you, Jessica, that was so helpful. And everyone, I put some links in the chat. Um, and I also wanna point out, I'm gonna put a link to um, smaller heat pump type air conditioners that you can put into just one room that are a little more affordable than redoing your whole house. Um, and I'll put that link in in just a moment. Um, but right now, I would like to introduce Michael or Mikey Rincon. Uh, who leads PSR LA's water work, um, PSR LA's water work of organizing, educating, and advocating with South, South, Southeast Los Angeles communities and community groups on local drinking water issues. Recently, his work has been focused on the effects of drought and extreme heat on accessible and affordable clean drinking water. Michael has also was also an advisory group member and uh, sorry, an advisory group member and with the safe and affordable funding for equity and resilience for the California State Water Resources Control Board before his term ended this last December. He is currently pursuing a master's in public policy at UCLA and with a focus on environmental justice and public health. Welcome, Michael. I hand the mic to you. <laughs> um, hello, can, can you all hear me? Awesome, awesome. Uh, yeah. Just wait for the slides and uh, yeah. Uh, so, <clears throat> hi, uh, I'm Michael Rincon, but I also go by Mikey. Uh, I am the Research and Policy Manager at Physicians for Social Responsibility in Los Angeles. And so today I'll be 
briefly going over what California is doing to address extreme heat, providing a broad overview of the current landscape of topics and solutions that uh, are currently in discussion uh, that relate to extreme heat and how it's all interconnected. Um, so as we all know, California is a naturally dry and arid region, and it's no secret that we are starting to really experience hotter and longer summers and shorter and colder, uh, shorter, cold, wet winters. Um, studies are actually predicting that the majority of California will see an increased number of extreme heat days in the next 40 years, with some coastal regions experiencing a little less. But I do want to add that those same coastal regions um, that will be seeing less heat days are areas that are predicted to be affected by sea level rise. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the areas of California that will be seeing additional heat days are also regions where there are more low income uh, households, uh, communities, et cetera. Uh, next slide. And so both uh, where, where both uh, extreme heat and socioeconomic factors uh, if we take into, uh, into account both of these factors, um, you uh, can imagine the results will end up being an increase in ER visits associated with extreme heat, uh, likely adding strain to our hospitals and clinics. So for example, it is predicted that uh, in LA, uh, there will be, um, it's more likely in the next 40 years uh, that the region will experience uh, daily excess uh, ER visits because there is, in fact, a larger population, but also has resources available. Um, LA has the resources available to be able to navigate through such events. However, rural regions like the northern coast of California uh, that is predicted to see a higher rate of ER visits uh, compared to what they are accustomed to may not be as prepared to handle such events. Uh, next slide, please. And so to really mitigate the public health impacts of extreme heat, uh, we have to ensure that people are able to keep themselves cool and stay hydrated. However, to be able to do so, uh, there are things that need to be um, addressed to really protect our communities. Uh, next slide. So first, uh, for people to stay hydrated, people need to actually have a, access to safe and clean drinking water. But uh, here's a not so fun fact. Uh, did you know that when, uh, according to newer research, and at least to my knowledge as well, that it's new, uh, is that um, the newer, newer research is suggesting that when you're severely dehydrated and drink water, the body is so focused on getting water to the drier parts of the body that certain body filtration systems that prevent you know, contaminants from uh, traveling throughout the body uh, don't actually trigger. So then, um, in cases of severe dehydration, you might be more likely to absorb toxic contaminants present in contaminated drinking water. And so uh, the reason I'm sharing this is because in 2012, uh, California has established, California established that as long as you live in California, you have the right to safe, clean, affordable, and accessible drinking water. However, not every single community sees this quality of water or service. Today, over 800 water utilities in California are failing or at risk of failing to provide water that meets the human right to water. Um, so poor water quality as shown here is a, is a primary um, factor as to why you know, these systems are failing. And poor water quality is driven by uh, a vast number of toxic contaminants or cysts present regionally. Uh, drought and water source insecurity is driving a lack of accountable water um, uh, accessible water, sorry. And both of these uh, factors um, contribute to high water rates and low water uh, utility um, infrastructure capacity, which ultimately is a, a, a problem, you know, for a lot of these communities that are going to be experiencing extreme heat. Um, and to address, you know, what we're doing at the state level is that to address water quality issues across the state, uh, we not only should be supporting at-risk water systems to make necessary investments to provide their customers safe drinking water, but we also need to start holding industries accountable for releasing the toxic contaminants in the first place that are contaminating these local uh, water supplies. Ultimately, also, you know, relieving the burden of the costs from water customers, which is, you know, unfair. Uh, next slide. And so... 
the effects of climate change in California is causing one of the worst droughts ever on record, along with, um, you know, extreme heat. And the current drought that we're in, and yes, we are still in a drought, um, you know, is record-breaking after we just had another record-breaking drought that ended in 2015. And um, yeah, even after 13 atmospheric rivers, the state just, uh, most of the state did recover, you know, of uh, from the drought, uh, at least visually, but all, most of our reservoirs, uh, specifically our groundwater aquifers, uh, have not necessarily improved much. So again, no, we're not out of a drought. Um, and California's groundwater is extremely valuable, and most Californians receive a blend of local water sources like groundwater uh, or recycled water, and the rest is likely imported from sources such as, for example, the Colorado River, which is currently in a critical state. Uh, California is heavily dependent on the Colorado, and as well as six other states in the American West. Um, but, you know, California actually has a majority of the water rights because of our size and other legal reasons. But because of those rights, we have actually caused restrictions to be placed on other states that are not necessarily using as much water. Um, and, you know, these states are also dealing with a 20 year mega drought that is impacting the American West. And as of a, as of a month ago, there is heated debate, no pun intended, about who needs to cut back on water use. And to be honest, this whole situation is really California's fault because we as Californians want to sustain our, our way of life and our cities and our population, which to, you know, really looking at, at it from, um, from a, uh, looking at the bigger picture, I mean, it uh, it's a situation that should, for example, our cities and our population shouldn't be as big as they are because our natural resources were not really meant to sustain them in the first place. So why am I sharing all this? Uh, next slide. Because, um, and the connection to other things is that, you know, it's really imperative that we continue to make the strides to make bold strides, sorry, uh, forward uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that exacerbate both extreme heat and drought. They go hand in hand with our climate system, which has been altered by greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, to avoid the worst of the impacts in our near future, it is imperative that we continue to make significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and improve air quality. Um, however, the imprint of fossil fuels is deeply embedded in our way of life, from the gas to, in your car to the petroleum-dependent products such as the plastics we use every day. Um, that seizing the use of fossil fuels will require a fundamental shift in how we procure and use energy. So while we continue to phase out you know, fossil fuels in California, we also need to be supporting the efforts such as requiring emissions inventories uh, through AB 617 um, that require um, point sources to really you know, provide a record and share data on uh, what they're emitting and how much they're emitting uh, locally. Um, furthermore, um, a study published by USC in, in 2022 um, found that between uh, 2014 and 2019, the risk of death increased by 21% on days where there was both extreme heat and poor air quality days, um, and that people older than 75 were more, were more likely to die under these conditions. Um, next slide. And so I'm gonna do my best to do this justice, um, you know, because I don't necessarily work on, on this stuff. This is more of Edgar's thing. So Edgar, correct me if I'm wrong on anything. Um, but um, as we continue to work to phase out fossil fuels and decarbonize our communities, we also must continue to ensure that we fill the void of, uh, of what fossil fuels will, will leave behind with renewable energy sources but also to make sure that we are not rushing to implement solutions that haven't necessarily been assessed thoroughly. At this time, you know, I'm not gonna get into too much detail about it, but green hydrogen is one of those uh, potential solutions that is being implemented that hasn't necessarily been fully assessed. And we at PSRLA have definitely been spending a lot of time understanding the extent of what green hydrogen means in California. Um, there are also, uh, ongoing efforts into electrifying infrastructure, as you know, as the previous speaker was talking about, uh, buildings and industries, as and the applications to buildings and industries. Um, but a question that keeps on coming up, at least at the state level, is whether or not all industries will be able to go full electric. 
Uh, for example, one area that has a lot of folks pretty stumped right now is um, whether or not we will be fully be able to electrify the food industry, specifically restaurants that often require open flames for some of their uh, food pe preparation. But there is well-rounded support for electrification overall. And in the California May revise that just came out, um, it there is a commitment by the state to fund equitable decarb, um, which can direct, which can support direct install programs targeted towards low-income residents to provide cooling such as heat pumps, uh, energy efficiency projects, um, building insul um, building insulation and ceiling projects, um, which is great because in areas such as like Los Angeles. Um, more than 60% of the buildings in the county are over 40 years old. And some of, and most of them still have the original insulation, such as like, uh, sorry, some of them still have single, ins, uh, the original insulation, as well as like single pane windows, original wiring, all of which can be impossible to upgrade for low income households. Um, however, the May revise um, does propose to delay funding and overall, you know, actually um, proposes a reduction in funding, which is ultimately also reducing um, the uh, the ability to invest uh, in vulnerable communities. Next slide. And so, one of the other topics that that's been um, that's really well uh, being or that's being worked on right now, um, our partners have been working hard for the last several years to get funding to support climate resilience centers, um, which at the states they're calling it the transformative climate communities, which are meant to be public spaces that are accessible to communities and offer resources that keep people cool or warm, um, and also uh, an opportunity to uh, a space to recover from other climate related disasters. Uh, the, TCC, the TCC program in California is where we can see projects that incorporate energy and water efficient buildings, um, heat pump projects as well, um, but also, you know, nature-based solutions that, that when implemented, you know, can help uh, regulate climate and also um, improve uh, climate and drought resiliency. Um, sometimes, you, you know, some of the projects around or some of the benefits around TCC is also providing resources to the community, such as, for example, bottled water to those who may have lost their, their water service because they just weren't able to pay the bills. Um, unfortunately, um, the budget is proposing to reduce funding for the 2023-24 fiscal year uh, for, uh, for this program. And our allies are working hard to ensure that the funding is sustained for TCC uh, as this program supports California communities that are the most impacted by environmental burdens and um, also supports community-led climate solutions uh, as a practice. Um, next slide. And lastly, um, you know, kind of wrapping all of this together around, you know, why we need to make sure that people have access to services and, and water, um, PSRLA had decided this year to sponsor Senate Bill 57, which, is authored, which was authored by Senator Lena Gonzalez. And um, in a sense, this bill would have required water, gas, and electric utilities to delay service shutoffs in times of extreme heat or cold until temperatures stabilized. However, unfortunately, this bill did not get as far as it as um, as it was ultimately pulled by the author because the Senate Energy Utilities and, and Comms uh, Committee wanted to completely gut and amend the bill to exclude water utilities, exempt utilities with less than 5,000 connections from having to comply with the requirements. Um, and though this bill is no longer progressing this year, we are going to be regrouping at the end of session um, you know, to really start hashing this out again. And so the, the fight continues. But um, I did want to share some of the things that we did come to learn uh, around you know, the issues around um, accessible and affordable utilities. Um, so first, uh, hospitalization rates start to increase as uh, temperatures begin to exceed 80 degrees or when they start to fall below 50 degrees. Uh, small water utilities have certain protections for their customers that they cannot turn off their service. They cannot turn off a customer's service until the account has been delinquent for more than 60 days. Additionally, uh, our friends at Community Water Center are currently uh, sponsoring Senate Bill 3, which is still in progress, 
and it aims to require all water utilities to delay shutoffs until an account is delinquent for 90 days. Um, there are statewide low income rate assistance programs for energy customers, but none exist for water customers. Additionally, water shutoff data is not required to be reported um, or shared, nor is uh, water customer arrears data required to be reported on. Um, but you know, that, um, that data is shared for energy customers. Um, water and energy uh, usage uh, peaks during summer months, which coincide with uh, the time of year where we actually start seeing higher bills. Household energy use in hotter months is higher in areas where there is low income communities of color and where there is a larger presence of older buildings. Um, a community assessment in Detroit showed that there is direct psychosocial stress that occurs when people do not have access to services such as water um, and the stress can kick in and spike as soon as receiving a notice for shutoff. Um, conservation resources uh, offered by utilities um, that help you save you know, water, energy, et cetera, or yeah, energy, um, are not easily accessible to all. Um, for example, renters, tenants, and undocumented households. Property owners who do apply for such resources like rebates or conservation kits reap the financial benefits but tenants may still be charged the same by the property owner uh, because the, the tenants don't often you know, get to actually see the bill. Um, and lastly, uh, people without access to utility services are more likely to experience health consequences such as gastro infections, cardiovascular, renal, or liver diseases that in extreme cases can, can lead to death, especially if you're someone with um, uh, that's in a sensitive population. Um, or part of the census population. And so um, though the outcome of this bill was not what we wanted for this year, um, there is clear indication based off of all the conversations that we're having today that um, a bill such as this, you know, is absolutely necessary for California's most vulnerable communities. Um, and so that in a just is why, you know, is, is what's pretty much going on at the state level right now. Um, next slide. And uh, that's that's just the summary of what I, I talked about the main policy uh, issues. But yeah, that's pr pretty much it. And um, you know, thank you for having me. And you know, I'm here to 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 chat. Thank you so much, Michael, Mikey. Um, I you know I'm really. Can everyone hear me? Okay, Giselle, am I okay? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, I'm really struck by how. All the all of these fantastic talks have made it so clear how interconnected these issues are between climate and health and utilities and equity and justice. And um, thank you so much. And now um, we are going to move into our discussion period um, that will be moderated by Edgar Barraza. And I'd like to just introduce Edgar briefly. Edgar is PSRLA's Energy Equity Policy Coordinator and leads PSRLA's statewide equitable building decarbonization policy efforts through the BEEP Coalition and supports building decarbonization policy efforts in the city of Los Angeles through the LEAP LA Coalition. He is also the lead point of contact for equitable building decarbonization at SAGE's Equi Energy and Equity Committee and actively engages in the newly formed grassroots-led Healthy Homes and Resilient Communities Committee. Throughout his career, he has championed integrating environmental justice principles into government decision-making and energy policies. Edgar, I hand the mic to you. Yeah, um, thank you so much for the warm introduction, Julie. Um, before we dive into the um, the questions, I did want to share out um, uh, or just uh, re-echo um, Mikey's um, important uh, work and topic around building decarbonization um, and some of the policy fights happening right now and just uh, some of the nears uh, near-term actions PSRLA is leading right now. Um, as he mentioned, um, this, uh, as he and Julie mentioned, 
Um, the CDC has about $900 million dedicated to pilot projects um, to help support equitable de building decarbonization. Um, and the CDC is hosting workshops statewide to get input from community members um, to help guide, uh, shape that program and help build the criteria um, to really ensure that those programs actually truly center equity and public health and making sure that low income communities have access to those funds as we know that as we know that they're going to be heavily impacted by climate change and also extreme heat and cold. Uh, so some of the kind of uh, some of the action items uh, PSRLA is taking um, and joint effort with PSR S, uh, SFA PSR we're actually going to be uh, developing and creating a training um, for uh, our memberships, of medical professionals and health advocates to learn more about um, building decarbonization and some of the EJ solutions to it. Um, and, and preparation for those workshops happening at the California Energy Commission. Um, so if you are a health professional member um, and are interested about that training and, and wanting to engage, uh, if you can just put it down the chat somewhere um, so I can just kind of collect that information. Um, it, uh, and for those who are not part, uh, members of PSR LA or uh, SFA PSR, um, I still highly encourage you to um, participate in these workshops as you'll have, um, as your input and feedback will help determine one of the biggest, largest investment of uh, climate investments to support building decarbonization. Um, all righty. So now jumping into the discussion, um, we all, we all learned about uh, extreme heat in, in the general sense, and now kind of want to touch it back and ground that into the, the local level um, and, and the community level. So this question is um, for, um, let's see, Robin Cooper, how has extreme heat or cold impacted your community? But most importantly, how has extreme heat impacted the most vulnerable population in your community? If you can, if you can share, Robin. Um, I, I appreciate the question. Um, I'm going to speak for people who often do not have a voice. Um, and as my role as a psychiatrist, I feel like it's my responsibility to speak for that population of the clients, the people who I treat, who do not often have a voice here. Um, it delves down um, and takes us away from the building decarbonization and, and electrification um, topic. But the community that I'm going to speak for are the severely mentally ill. This is a population that is extraordinarily vulnerable to extreme heat impacts. Um, and I think actually most of us have had some kind of experience. Have you ever seen someone on a really hot day all bundled up into in a jacket? And you think, what's with him? God, it's so hot out. Well, that person is likely a schizophrenic patient, someone uh, with schizophrenia. This is a vulnerable population. They die at a much greater rate than those without mentally ill diagnoses. Their mortality is greater, their um, hospitalizations are greater, and their emergency room visits are greater than populations that are not severely mentally ill. And the reason that I talk about this guy on the corner with his jacket on, well, one of the things that's kind of um, uh, surprising is that the, the nature of the disease of schizophrenia may have intrinsically impairments in the sense of, the, of a person's ability to experience their own heat. So they are not in, they can't take protective action just because of some impairments in the illness. Then we add on to that the medications that we treat them with, because the antipsychotics and almost all of the medications in the psychiatric pharmacopoeia make it difficult for the body to, to regulate its temperature and causes more overheating. So we actually treat people with medications that may make things worse. And that's a conundrum because we can't stop these uh, medications during these brief periods of extreme heat 
because that would have other ramifications for destabilizing their functioning. Add on social determinants of health. The severely mentally ill are, are often the poorest or some of the poorest. Their illness impairs the ability to make adequate living. They live in isolation often. And we know that isolation is one of the biggest determinants for lousy outcomes during extreme heat, not just for the severely mentally ill, the elderly, and anyone who's isolated. Isolation is a component. Substandard housing goes along with, uh, with, um, with poverty. Um, and then the nature of, of psychosis impairs judgment, the ability to problem solve, executive functioning, beginning the ability to carry out plans that you've made. Um, and so I'm speaking for those. There also, I just wanna bring up homeless and substance using mentally ill. Our homeless are tremendously at risk they don't have the ability to protect themselves from exposures. And um, I, I took a note, Barbara Warren is, in the, is here. She's from Tucson and says that they have heat protection projects. The homeless in Tucson and in Phoenix are coming into the ER with third degree burns from, from being on the sidewalks, burns because of not being able to get to be out of exposures. And then in, in San Francisco, particularly, but we're talking about uh, California, but uh, in general, um, that, um, that we've already talked a bit about um, the housing issues and our housing stock and how our, our buildings are not built to tolerate um, the kinds of heats that we're going to be experiencing. And in San Francisco, it's no surprise that the heat mapping, which shows areas of greatest heat, overlap with the same maps of, of poverty. So Bayview Hunters Point and Chinatown are some of the most impacted areas. And again, those are dense housing with people who live in tight quarters with urban heat effects with lower income communities. This is an issue of climate and social justice or really injustice. Um, so just some of my thoughts. Thank you, Robin, so much for, for that um, thoughtful and well-articulated response. And thank you for speaking on uh, folks who don't often have uh, access to, to platforms and speaking on the most vulnerable in your community. Um, I want to pass the same question to Jessica Bavad. Um, how has extreme heat or extreme cold impacted your community? But most importantly, how has it impacted the most vulnerable populations uh, in your community? Yeah, I want to highlight uh, being in the Bay Area, um, the normal weather is we don't have heat waves, uh, but in recent years we've had them. Um, and I do recall a weekend where in uh, the neighborhood of Portrero, it broke a record and it was 107 degrees. And I remember that weekend so clearly because we were all losing our minds. Yep. <laughs> and we couldn't sleep. It was very uncomfortable. Um, and so really, homes are not designed with air conditioners. We've never needed it. And the only places that did have it um, were if you go into like malls, for example, uh, hotels that have like climate control, uh, but it's very rare. The majority of the homes and buildings out here only have heaters because the only issue is the fact that it gets cold, colder, <laughs> and maybe not even as cold as other places, right? Um, so as a result of that, there has been uh, people get creative and a lot of people have actually bought swamp coolers, you know, for those, those heat waves that we've been having, but not everybody has the access or the capacity to run those kinds of appliances in their homes. Um, you know, I just have fans in my homes and, and 
put a fan in the window and you know uh use a spray bottle that's how i how i have dealt with the with the uh heat waves that have been happening in the bay area but it is obviously it you know can become a medical emergency for a lot of people especially the most vulnerable the elderly um and folks who have you know existing um medical um issues that they deal with so it's absolutely a problem and now that we're starting to see you know uh heat waves and fires more um impacting the bay area we're having to change that and plan for that and so in talking about this transition um into electrification that includes including appliances that would make our homes cooler in the event of um extreme heat thank you so much jessica um and make such a great point. Yes, um, Bay Area is not prepared, not well prepared for extreme heat, as it's generally a very um, cool area. Um, now, for a question for you, Mike, you, you did such a well job in explaining all those um, uh, impacts to a vulnerable population. So I'm going to skip that question for you. Um, so I want to uh, give you more of a policy focused question because you have so much, uh, you have a wealth of knowledge that I feel like a lot of folks uh, should uh, uh, know a little bit about. Um, but the question is for you is what is one equitable climate solution California needs to prioritize to address extreme heat? And I'll make it tough, but only one. Yeah. Um I think it's it's probably yeah, banning shutoffs of utility services. I think that's the most important thing for a lot of people. Uh, because um, the financial burden, you know, and the psychosocial burdens of like knowing that, you know, your services might be cut off, you know, um, affects a lot of people. And that puts them in a situation where they have to start picking, do I pay my rent? Do I pay for my water? Do I pay for food? Do I pay for my kid's lunch? Um, it's just... Uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. And, you know, I work closely with the communities of Southeast LA and like for them, um, you know, that's, that sees like some of the highest, you know, uh, rent, uh, water rates, energy bills in not just uh, the county, but in the state, but also nationally. Like uh, I think, um, yeah, I think, I think banning sh utility shutoffs, you know, during times of extreme weather is probably the most important thing right now to really, you know, keep people out of the hospital, keep them healthy, um, you know, and find also a way to transcribe that to, you know, to make sure that it's that's accessible also to to homeless individuals as well. Um, can I just make a comment, Mickey? I am so glad that this question got got uh, posed to you, that you actually chose one, but I will say. There is no one. The truth is climate change is a wicked problem with interconnections from, so, from many different things. And Mickey, you said that when you talked about air pollution and drought and electrification and energy sources and a whole variety of things. It is impossible to select one out and think that that's going to be adequate enough. Now, of course, we have to to focus our energies on policies and those come in one by ones, but we have to know that this is a wicked interconnected problem. Absolutely. And you know, um, a lot of my job and a lot, along with other water advocates across the state, is that um, there has to be a huge restructuring of the systems that currently exist, you know, to provide services to uh, Californians or just the US or the population in general. Um, but right now, at least for water advocates, the situation is that we're just trying to make sure that the system doesn't fail because it's going to at some point within the next 50 years. Um, you know, you're gonna start see like, I mean, Mendocino County like was already experiencing day zero scenarios that like, several months ago, like they had a truck in water. And then if they ran out of water, like they have to wait till the next truck comes in like a week later. So, um, and Ains were telling their tours, yeah, don't shower. Um, but you know, it's the central coast. So it's okay. 
uh, but uh, yeah, so right now, at least for us, we're literally putting out fires like, you know, uh, as they're coming up. And um, so we're just trying to make sure that the system doesn't fail. And that's, it's hard. It's really hard because it's a losing battle. Um, I'm not gonna lie. Um, but yes, to address, you know, all these others, like, yes, we have to address it as a whole. Uh, but, you know, I think that if water goes, we're not going to last that much longer. So that's why I chose the utility services. Yeah, thank you so much for answering that, Mikey. And yes, um, did not mean to um, favoritize one solution as um, the fossil fuel has been interconnected into all of our parts of life and uh, continue to impact our lives negatively. Um, uh, we definitely see that as a very interconnected issue and means that we have to need a very interconnected and collaborative approach with all organizations and all peoples uh, of race, ethnicity, background um, to join on this, on this fight. I just want to check in with Julie really quick uh, for time check. Do we have enough time for one more question or are we at time? Yeah, let's, let's do two more questions because there's an important question from Jay Wilson in the chat. Do you want me to read it? You, you're welcome to, whichever. If you can read it, uh, that'll be... Uh, this is a question for Dr. Cooper. Have you or have you ever considered approaching SFPD's Chief Scott or the police union to present your work regarding the correlation of hot weather and violence with view to getting them on the side of politically lobbying for urgently needed local climate action? I have. Occurred... Yeah, go ahead. Go on, Julie. Oh, it, it, he, Jay goes on to say it occurs to me that they would be interested in lowering violence in the community as a result of providing safer working environment for, and it would provide more a safer environment for their members and everyone. Uh, can you get me an invitation? Um, I have not considered talking to the police about this, um, but I do think we need um, everyone on board um, and collaboration specifically between community organizations and neighborhoods and the mental and the Department of Mental Health Services and the Department of Public Health and bring on the police. <laughs> Thank you. So. There, there's also a question from Becky for Mikey, uh, Michael. Have you seen the federally funded low income household water assistance program reaching California households who need assistance? Yeah, I did see that question and I responded in the chat. Um, yeah, so for federal LIWAP, um, yes, we're, we're engaged on, on you know, really see, improving the program so that it's accessible to, uh, to everyone. I think that the thing is, is that the way that the program is structured, like water utilities, for example, like specifically, um, have to, uh, because it is a water program, but um, this, the water systems have to actually apply for the funding uh, and, the, and, and that. So like, the thing is, is that a lot of places won't, uh, a lot of water utilities actually will not apply for the funding. And um, our general belief is that because there is a, a lack of transparency on a lot of things around water, um, it's kind of like inviting, you know, the cops over to your house when, you know, you committed a murder or something like that. You know, so you're inviting the scene of the crime because, you know, you, you, you say, hey, you know, we need the funding, you know, here's our data. You know, the, the feds are going to be like, well, something's going on here. And then that's why. Um, and also, you know, it's, and, and there are some cases too where like for at least for, for private water utilities, like it's in their best interest that they can keep, you know, fining and 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 putting, you know, late fees on their customers, you know, than it is to address the problem. Um, and it happens very often, unfortunately. So um, there's that, but also because LIWAP, uh, you know, as a federal program, undocumented households don't qualify. Uh, automatically um so that's another you know obstacle so we're trying to create a LIWAP program at the state level um and you know uh, taking what we can that works and trying to improve it where you know it definitely needs improving um so that it's accessible to everyone so yeah thank you and Edgar did you have one last question and then we'll wrap it up 
Um, it very similar, it, um, not so much a question, more of a comment about um, federal funds and state funds that help um, with uh, energy efficiency um, and programs to help improve um, homes is that when we often see the federal and state programs provide incentives, oftentimes those incentives don't actually reach low income communities. Those incentives usually help um, come in under rebate program, which means that low income income households have to pay the upfront costs to these technologies to adapt or get energy efficiency or water efficiency or even heat pump water heaters um, and the cost of these technologies are very expensive and so I just wanted to uh, emphasize that some even though even though there have a lot of incentive programs out there that actually actually benefit medium or more wealthier folks who are being impacted by climate change and it's so important um, that um, advocating for these programs, we need better programs to actually pay for the upfront costs. Um, that way, low income communities don't have to worry about upfronting $10,000 or $20,000 for home retrofits. So, just wanted to share that out. There's a lot of money out there, but that money is not really equitable or coming in equitable, and why equitable solutions are still needed. That is such an important point, Edgar, that we need to keep messaging over and over and over, right? Um, and also the need for one-stop shops because people need, Bay Ren, you know, has not necessarily been serving lower income communities very well because they just don't have enough people to really, you know, offer the help that's needed. Um, so yes, absolutely. Thank you for making that. Um, any last, burning questions if not we've gone over time so i do want to wrap it up well thank you so much this really was what like of all our events this event really brought together as i said before the interconnectedness of all these issues and i'm so happy we were able to explain that and so grateful to edgar and michael and jessica and robin and uh and uh rupa basu for joining us tonight thank you everyone for coming and uh we will be posting this recording so if you know someone who'd really like to watch this event please you can share it with them i will be sending links to the resources and the link to the recording to everyone who rsvp'd so thank you thank you thank you and good night everyone thank you thank you